So hello and happy Friday. I'm glad that you're here. If this is your first time, welcome. If you've come back and you've seen this before, I'm glad that you came back. This is episode number 96 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. And what we're talking about today are topics that were presented by people that wrote to me during the past week through Facebook, through YouTube, comments down below. If you have a question, you can submit your own comments. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. And as I said, this is episode number 96, and today is Friday, February the 5th. I guess it's National Weather Person Day, and what happened this past week? Something terrible. The groundhog here in the United States got out, Poxitani Phil, saw his shadow, and that means six more weeks of winter. That's what they say. So I don't know if the weather people care about that or not. So what else is going on? Uh, you can join us on Facebook, links down in the video description. Also, for those of you who are listening via podcast, thank you for being here. And those of you who didn't know that you could get this on podcast, look for the link down in the video description. It's on Podbean, and the podcast is titled The Way to Be. So this is The Way to Be. So what else is going on? That's it. We're going to get right into the questions because we have a lot to cover today. Let's be honest. There's a lot of stuff. There's something cool that I want to talk to you about too, so please stick around for it. The first question comes from somebody named Random. That's an original screen name there. About the Himalayan salt water, could we take dry salt mix with salt and dry sugar as early spring supplements or emergency feed? Can the bees digest that? Okay, so here's the thing. I did a lot of salt tests. Oh, I just happened to have a bag of Himalayan salts here. I do a lot of practical observations, basically, when it comes to the bees and what they want and what they take and what they don't. So what happens is this ties in with something that I kind of had an issue with some of my viewers in the past. All the different things that uh, you see me do or test or what the bees show a preference for, and in this case, uh, we had all the different sea salts together, and Himalayan salt isn't actually sea salt, but what it is, is it's vitamin-packed, excuse me, back up, mineral-loaded. And it comes from a time before the earth was covered with pollution in the air and acid rain and all that other stuff, so it's actually mined out of the ground. And that's even how some sea salts are gathered. They mine for those. They go down to salt deposits beneath the surface of the earth, and they draw them all out. But anyway, the bees went for salts in water. How much? A teaspoon per quart of sea salts or Himalayan pink crystal salts with pure water. So we know that they showed a preference for that. And we did higher salinity tests and lower salinity. And that teaspoon per quart was what the bees ultimately arrived at. And there are some discussions about maybe that changes a little bit through the year. But we know that they use it. So water bees are the senior bees. They are not foraging for nectar anymore. They're the oldest foragers that fly in and out of the hive. Watering is the final job outside the hive. So then the other question here is, and I understand people want to do this. You want to combine things. If one thing's good for them, then let's put it all together. But here's what I like to do. I like to separate those things because then we get into sugar syrup. We know that the bees will go for sugar syrup, and then there are appetite stimulants, which we also tested. And uh, they showed a preference of the feeding stimulants tested. Uh, beekeeper's choice was number one. Number two was honeybee healthy. Number three was Man Lakes Pro Health. Now, we might think, well, let's just combine them all together and make a sugar syrup that has them all. That way we get all the benefits. And while we're at it, let's drop some of that Himalayan sea salt in there. And I ask people not to do that because we want to feed things free choice. So we have pure water over here. So the bee that only wants water can go to that. And then if this forager needs something with a higher mineral content like salts from the pink Himalayan salts or whatever, then they'll go to that one. And then another bee goes after the sugar syrup to fortify the bees in the colony. And this is why we do it in winter with the heavy sugar syrups, two to one by weight. So they actually may store that as a resource in the hive. Now, if we combine the salts with the sugar syrup, a desperate bee that goes after just sugar syrup ends up taking on board the salts as well, even though they may not show a preference for that. So how would you find out? 
you put out a feeder that has sugar syrup and sugar syrup with salts in it and then see what they'll go for and you'll find out. They'll prefer the sugar syrup because the water bees are not the same bees that would be going after nectar. I hope that makes sense. So sugar syrup is a fake nectar. The salts and minerals have a different purpose for the bees. So I say, please do not combine those. So that answers that question right off the bat. And that's the reasoning behind it. And you can do that practical test at home. See what's going on. Next one is from B. Wiser. That's interesting too. B. Wiser, that's a catchy name. Last year I tried unsuccessfully to keep my four hives from swarming by adding extra boxes. I was only able to find one swarm in time to recapture it this year I bought a couple of variety of swarm traps to try out in addition to adding boxes. One of the swarm traps includes space where you add four frames inside in addition to baiting it with something like Swarm Commander. <laughs> this is Swarm Commander by the way. It comes in these little packets now, little capsules that you break and then smear it around. Anyway. You mentioned you use some of your older drawn comb to put in swarm traps. My concern is whether putting in drawn comb frames will be an invitation to wax moss as the traps wait for the bees, hopefully to arrive. Now I have, um, wax moths certainly can go after old comb. It's their job, it's what they do. The moths will lay their eggs and then those little wax worms will come out, they'll develop and they'll devour old comb. That's how wild bees, feral bees that are in bee trees, nobody goes in there, they don't have beekeepers to pull out the old comb. So for periods when those are unoccupied, the wax moths would fly, lay their eggs, the wax worms do their business in there, and they devour the remaining old comb. And then another swarm moves into that same cavity, look, an open space, and all that detritus is on the bottom. And then they make new comb, because comb does not last forever. So I just wanted to tie that in there too, that the wax moths serve a purpose in unattended colonies. Now this happens when we have bees, bee frames, drawn comb, old stuff in storage. I've come across that before where when it's all closed up, uh, you get some wax moths in there and then what happens, they lay their eggs and you have the wax worms and then what do we have? Cocoons and spider webby looking stuff everywhere. And I have in the past put frames like that in strong beehives to see if the bees will clean it all up, and they do. It's a lot of work. It's a big mess, but they do it. So it has that potential if you have a swarm trap set out. And by the way, if you're thinking about setting out swarm traps, this is the time of year to do it because things are about to change. And the longer they're out there, I think the better. This time of year is too cold, so we don't have the wax moths flying around, at least not here in the state of Pennsylvania in the northeastern United States. We're too cold for small hive beetles. We're too cold for wax moths to be flying around and laying. So actually setting out swarm traps for early spring is a good time because they're not out there laying their eggs everywhere. Now at the end of the year, but we're not trapping swarms anyway, but like midsummer on, you could expect that a hive that's set out like that, that has a bunch of drawn old comb in it with those scents and those attractants built into it, that you would more likely get the attention of the wax moth and of course the eggs they'll lay and of course their larvae that messes everything up in there. But I've actually not personally had a swarm trap set out by itself get uh, taken out by wax worms yet. So that's interesting. Has the potential, but uh, those are the very same things that attract the swarm too, so I think it's worth the risk. And what, what are you risking? You have old comb that you were going to get rid of anyway. That's what I do. And then so if bees don't move into it, you were going to dispose of it anyway. So if the wax worms get in there and chew up that old comb, just throw it out, swap it out for something new. And you can also bait your swarm traps with bits of propolis and burr comb and things like that that just sprinkle on the bottom and seed it in there. And that adds more scent to let those bees, those scouts that are going to go out, sometimes days or weeks before they even swarm, scouts are out there inspecting all those cavities and trying to find a suitable place to live. Sometimes they'll tease you and the scouts will show up and start guarding an entrance. You think, yes, they're going to move into that swarm trap. And then five days later, there's nothing going on there. So they have to win. It's a democratic process, the honeybee democracy. So all these scouts are trying to convince the others where they want them to go. 
The next question is from Fred S. And uh, I have a good quantity of honey left over from last year's spring harvest, which has crystallized. Raw honey does that. After it began to crystallize, I've kept it in the freezer and refrigerator so it wouldn't ferment. That's a good plan and it's a good method to prevent fermentation. My plan is that this spring, I'll gently warm it back to a liquid state and feed it to my bees using inverted pail feeders on top of each hive, protected by a deep box to prevent robbing. I understand that warm and crystallized honey back to liquid is a event, eventual losing battle. As more often you'll rewarm it to a liquid state, the quicker it will revert back to its crystallized state. I'm wondering if by feeding it to the bees, this will rejuvenate the honey since the bees will be adding their enzymes. I'm hoping that when it is re-harvested later this spring it won't tend to crystallize as fast as it otherwise would do if I had just rewarmed it. I don't sell my honey but just give it to friends and family but I've been hesitant to give them the crystallized honey as it isn't in pristine condition. Though I understand that honey is still good as long as it hasn't fermented. Do you think this is a good plan? Do you think this holds water? Okay, here's the thing. Um, part of this too is we share what we do personally. So as a beekeeper, what would I do? And I don't like recycling honey back to the bees, even when it crystallizes in frames. But there are some parameters we can talk about and the things we can talk about to keep your honey from crystallizing. And one of those things is temperature. But uh, when you don't filter your honey at all, or you just use a coarse filter, like a 600, uh, usually when you get filters, you know, that sit on top of a five gallon bucket, they come in three sizes, 200, 400, and 600. Now, if you put it on the really fine screen, the 200, because it's just like raindrops falling out of the sky, snowflakes, every snowflake has collided with a particle in the air that allowed it to develop its little crystals and then drift to earth. Isn't that interesting? So, when honey crystallizes, it crystallizes, these crystals form on particles in suspension in the honey. So that's bits of wax, sometimes that's bits of pollen, and uh, other detritus that's actually in the raw honey. So if you filter some of that out, so let's say you use the 200 micron filter. 200 microns or finer, the lower the number, the finer the, the filtering. So if you get those particles out of there, so at 200, you'd still have some pollen floating around in there, but you'd get rid of some of the bigger chunks, some of the bits of wax, propolis, and things like that, and even bee parts. So if you get that out of there, you reduce the opportunity for the crystallization of the honey to happen. So another thing that you can do, and by the way, for those of you who are thinking about reheating crystallized honey, be very careful, because if you overheat it, you'll ruin it. So I'm gonna tell you what you can do to keep from ruining it, if you're going to heat it, heat it to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And for the rest of you, that's 40 degrees Celsius. The honey still remains raw and unruined. So, and of course, don't keep that heat up there. Once it's liquefied and once you're, if you're heating it up to run it through a filter or something like that, do all that right away. Don't hold it at that temperature for a longer period of time. Then, if you're going to refeed this to your bees, it should go back to the hive that it came from because this is part of practicing biosecurity with your bees. If you collect a bunch of honey and then you reliquify it and you want to feed it back to the bees, first of all, you can feed it back to your bees in its solid state. So part of the question here is, I'm wondering if by feeding it to the bees, if this will rejuvenate the honey since the bees will be adding their enzymes, not really because they're consuming it in the spring. Now, if they were going to recycle it, like let's say you set out a robbing station, which defeats the purpose because you can't control which bees come to that. But if you set that honey out at a robbing station, then those are your foragers that will return with the honey and they're going to put it straight into the cells in the hive. And they'll consume some of it to compensate themselves for the energy expended to go and get it. But honey is the biggest payoff for robbing bees, foraging bees, because it's the highest sugar content and takes very little to no processing. And the reason I bring that up is they have put it in their honey crop. 
they have recycled it and put it back out. So they have added the enzymes that we're talking about here. So, but inside the hive, they may just consume it, which doesn't necessarily mean they re kind of condition the honey for you. So anyway, below 52 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius, yeast cannot grow and the honey will not ferment. So that means you have an opportunity to get the water out of there, by the way. Desiccant packs, dryers, whatever you want to do, because stored honey by itself without being protected by the bees has the potential to have condensation form on it and it can actually increase the moisture content of the honey even when it has wax capping on it. So you have to be very careful about how honey that's no longer under the care of the bees gets stored. So freezing it is a good move and uh, a gradual thaw so that you don't get condensation on the surface of it. That's the other thing. So I have uh, honey and big hive totes right now that have desiccant packs in there. I did that for the first time this winter and no condensate forms on there. So it's very interesting, but I'm not a big fan of feeding honey back to your bees unless it's come from the same colony, then you're probably okay. But I wouldn't transfer it around because pathogens from bees, including American fowl brood can be transmitted through honey. So I wouldn't do it. So that can be a good plan, but uh, just be aware of what the risks are. Give it back to the bees that, that made it in the first place, sure. Okay, the next thing is, this is from Peter Menard, Pacifica, California. This is a very lengthy and involved one, and I just happen to have an answer for this today, so that's pretty cool. Before asking my question, I just want to say thank you for describing and for your decision-making process in your videos. You always qualify information you share in regards to where it is on the spectrum from well-supported scientific evidence. Thank you. I always try to underpin what information I put out with actual studies that are ongoing, or I'll just say, it's just my opinion. Anyway, I typically lose most of my colonies every September through November lose most of my colonies every September through November. So this is no small thing. Over the past few years, I've done many of the standard things to encourage the health of my colonies going into our fall dearth, including tweaking my Varroa treatment approaches in response to more specific indicators, managing resources available to the bees and making splits and catching swarms from hives that have survived a year or more. Working from home during the pandemic this year provided me the opportunity to make daily observations during the heat of the day instead of in the cool of the morning and evening. What I saw was quite a wake-up call, a two-month war with relentless yellow jackets. I had observed them during previous years, but never in the numbers and with the persistence I was able to witness during the day while being home. Previous years, when I caught the yellow jackets gaining access to the hives, and during those morning and evening times, my assumption was that they were mainly taking advantage of the hives already on the way out because I missed opportunities to intervene with their problems. I don't know how much responsibility they ultimately deserve for my losses each year, but they are definitely not helping. So this year, after also seeing my wasp traps fill repeatedly, without making a dent in their numbers at the hives, I'm determined to find additional ways to keep them from harassing my bees. Quick note, during warm dry years with no late fall cold snap, we are seeing yellow jackets year round here. I put out some frames for my bees to clean up just a week ago and sure enough, within a few hours, there were some yellow jackets midst the bees collecting the honey on the frames in late January, exclamation point. One of the strategies I've been considering has been under floor entrances. There are beekeeper testimonies online suggesting they are much more difficult for a yellow jacket to access than a horizontal entrance and give the guard bees an additional upper hand. Are you aware of any evidence for this? I have been resistant to using them because I really value the ability to observe landing board activity, but then I thought that maybe I could combine a landing board with a vertical underfloor entrance. Preserve the ability to observe the bees and get some of the yellow jacket deterring effect in the vertical hive access. 
This would also enable me to take care of some of the other things I don't like about traditional bottom boards. Like add a small tilt to the landing board to shed water. Use a substantial piece of wood for below the screen insert rather than the flimsy corrugated polypropylene and eliminate corners in which debris accumulates around the under screen. That's the insert there. Here's a link to the sketch and he sent a really nice, you know, CAD type sketch of the entrance board and what's going on. And this is really interesting because I've been thinking about the same stuff. We get, and not on this scale though, this is a lot of loss when it comes to the loss attacking. And I have video after video of yellow jets attacking. And last year, even the European Hornets making their appearance on very cold days. So the advantage always goes to the yellow jackets, to the wasps. So even the European Hornet, which is the only Hornet that's here in the United States, except for the Asian giant Hornet that's made an appearance in the state of Washington that everybody's all excited about. But uh, yellow jackets are smaller and they do attack in mobs. So I've given a lot of thought to that because I was also listening to a guy that was talking about, you know, the mushrooms and how those might benefit the bees. And he made a comment when he was talking about that because we're talking about the microbiome of the bees. So it's a totally different thing, nutritional benefit and so on. But he's designing a feeder to put out to get those mushroom, those uh, nutrients out to the bees. And they don't want them to be robbed by yellow jackets and other wasps. So what he said was, bees are maze runners. Wasps are not. So he, he and I wrote right away, by the way, I've subscribed to that uh, mushroom research channel and everything else because I want that information. I wrote and I said, when you get that feeder out, send me one because I want to see it because it seems cool. And it would be great to be able to put out feed as described here, that doesn't get robbed by wasps right along with the bees. But here's the other thing. Now we're talking about at the hive. And I've thought about this too because I thought, well, if there's some kind of weird entrance design that would benefit the bees but not the wasps, that would be cool to put that on your beehive. And I understand a hive opening in the bottom that benefits the bees and not the wasps. You know, wasps go into every angle. I don't necessarily see that alone as a huge advantage because... Um, I've seen wasps, wasps are backdoor robbers. You know, they come at the sides, they'll dive straight down into a hole. They'll go up into a hole. So when we see wasp behavior, they exploit any opening that they can find. So I was thinking about that maze thing and all of that. Well, anyway, long story short, I do have a solution for Peter. And this thing, this came in the mail today because I've been looking into this. This is a channel and you're gonna look at this and think, yeah, whatever. But I'm gonna be testing this this year and I'm gonna be testing it for a lot of reasons. So I'm gonna put this in at least half of my beehives. And this is something that comes out of New Zealand and it was presented at Apamandia by the inventor who decided that where they live in New Zealand they have a wasp problem that is well beyond anything described even here. More wasps and they can devastate entire colonies of bees, even the strong ones, because when do the wasps fly? And I've made these videos too, and it always is so frustrating. You get out there as described by Peter here, go out there early in the morning, the wasps, the bees are still semi-clustered. It's a cold day, even in you know September, for example, which by the way, is when the wasps are at their peak demand because they're making queens and the queens are gonna to have to survive winter. So when they're making queens, they're feeding their babies animal protein and they're going to get stuff. And then the queens that have hatched out are also intense because they need to fatten up in order to get through winter. So they're after the nectar. So it's a full spectrum assault. Anyway, the, the type of thing that I was thinking about, whether it's a, some kind of serpentine channel, because guess what? I have an observation hive too and the entrance comes in at the bottom 90 degree turn and then it goes up into the hive. Guess what never goes in there? Yellow jackets. So when we add a configuration, and that's a long tube, by the way, an inch and a half in diameter tube. So what this is, it's called a hive gate. And I'm gonna put a link to this down in the video description because I have a special ask. Like I said, they just came today, so I haven't tested them, but I've read about it and I watched the presentation. 
And I like the idea that what this is, is a long channel. So when this goes to the entrance, the bees come and go, and then they can vent through here underneath the cluster inside the hive. So this is also a Four Seasons style entrance. Because when we've seen the wasps get in, when they do, when it's really cold and the bees aren't down there yet, they scoot through the entrance and they shuffle along the side and they go up and they have this advantage, they start robbing out the colony right away. Then by the time the bees warm up, there's a bunch of wasps in there. Why? Because the scout wasp showed up first, found the resource, found a not so well protected colony of honeybees in this beehive, and then when it went in and got its resources, it took off and zipped back. And when it came back, it had 10 of its friends with it, and then 20 of its friends, and then 30, and so on. So now we've got a mass of bees. So by the time it warms up and these bees wake up, the attack is already happening. And now we have dead bees and dead wasps all over the landing board. So what this inventor is working on and has done is created a very simple appearing solution. If a wasp comes to the entrance and they come with these metal entrance guards that go over the top of it, but it works with wooden ones and stuff. And the flow hive, there's two little blue entrances up there in that flow hive too, because that has a little narrow entrance. So I tuck some of these in there to see if they would fit. So they do, they fit all my hives. So you don't have to have this metal piece, but I thought if I'm going to evaluate it, I'm going to get everything that this company makes to try it out. And this is a heavy piece of galvanized steel. Anyway, and it has two settings. So this goes on your landing board. You can have two of these together. So they go like that. And you'd have another one on the other side, or you can flip it and just have a single. And you notice that it has this long thing, which is long lines of what I was thinking why not have a really long entrance and make these wasps run the gauntlet? Because that wasp now can't just scoot through the entrance and shuffle off to the side. He has to go through this full length. And what's going to be over here, because under the cluster, that's the warmer spot inside your lower box, which is generally your brood box. And then he's going to have to engage bees right in here. And this is pretty well thought out because now that I have it in hand, the surface is all textured so the bees can get their grips on it. They can get their feet well. Um, they can hold on to it really well because sometimes I've seen bees when they're trying to vent a hive and they're holding a really smooth landing board, which because I've put a high finish on some of my beehives, even while they're venting, their feet are kind of gradually sliding and then they have to move forward. So this has a texture because where are they going to be venting if you have a single entrance on your hive? Right through these. So this is set up, they have two of them. Now, here's the other thing. Why not just make a solid bottom board and have a groove cut into it with a router or something? And then the bees will have this control area, right? And then you just put some kind of solid cover on it so we make these channels. Uh, one of the reasons is because in the wintertime, when you have this here and the clusters over here, on the southeast side of my hives, the clusters tend to shift over to that side, whatever gets warmest in the morning, for example. So then what happens is with these is through that opening, you can actually tilt this so that this opening remains under the cluster, not to the cold unoccupied part of that bottom box. So this moves over here. Now this is all theory for me because all I did was read it, look at their videos, and I'm gonna put a link down to their YouTube too there's not a lot of explanation on YouTube, but the company's called BIQ. So if you've heard of them or if you've tried anything like this, please write your comments down below because I'm dying to hear about it. The other thing is I want Peter to get a couple of these. And if you do, and if it doesn't solve the wasp problem, I'll pay for it. I'll pay you back. So whatever you paid for this stuff, if you get a bunch of them and they don't work, just for you, not for everybody watching because I can't afford to buy everybody one of these. But there's a patent pending on it, and I like all the stuff I read. I like the Apamondia presentation, and the people at Apamondia that bought these there, uh, some people tried to replicate them out of other materials, and then they later came and bought the actual one. These are just made out of a type of plastic that's UV um, resistant and stuff like that. But anyway, um, they were really happy and it saved them. So here's the other thing I'm wanting to know about. So this is just me now. Forget the company that made them and stuff, but 
This is a ready-made, easy to get channel to get this going. So I thought when we have the bees robbing, we usually put a robbing screen in front. Oh man, I didn't see my robin screen. The white robin screens from Bee Smart Designs. The bees come out and they go up through the top. And sometimes though, even the robbers, because the robbers are often honeybees. They don't have a hard time figuring out that opening and getting in there. And then there's a big wide area with those robbing screens. The bees that are resident to the hive have this big wide area to defend. So I've never really liked that. I mean, it worked, um, but could it have worked better? So don't get mad at me if you're Bee Smart Designs people. But I think this channel, making them walk the gauntlet, actually is more effective because guess what else happens? I put together a mock-up. So here's the box and this is how it would look in there. And this is how that entrance would look if you had the single. And this, of course, would not be open because you have your front of your beehive on here and it's held on here by little screws. I have not tested it. I'm not saying it works. I'm saying I like the theory. So then this thing sticks into the hive, well into the hive. So let's say a wasp went in there or a robber honeybee, one of the scouts, because that's when we want to get them. We want to get them when just the scouts are getting there, not once they bring in a whole attack party, an attack team that comes in strong. Anyway, they scoot through here. Let's say it's a wasp, gets through. Oh, there's a bee, oh, there's a bee. Gets through, gets in here, scoots out, gets into the hive. Now it's running around. Now the other bees have realized that it's there, they're warming up and they start chasing the wasp. Where does the wasp go to get out? They're dumb. They're not like bees who can memorize where they went out, went in and how they can get back out. So now the wasp is running around all over the place, being chased by bees and it can't get out. Do we really want to keep it in there? Yeah, we do, because if it dies, it can't go home and communicate to the other wasps where this resource is so they don't come back. Same thing for those big strong colonies that send out their attack teams. And those scout bees get in there, let's say they get on landing board, they don't get a, because now the bees are on equal footing because they're all awake. If there's bees flying to attack, there are some differences in the lines of bees, the stock of bees and their ability to fly earlier than others and things like that. But if all things were equal, if they're scouting on the landing board, then these guys in this colony are awake too. But they still try to get in. The strongest colonies go after the lesser colonies but they don't want to waste their lives and they don't want to waste their resources. They go for the easy pickings. So this is why I say don't put these on all the hives because I won't know the difference. So I got a bunch of them. I'm going to put them on half my hives and I'm going to see what's going on because it just makes sense. If that scout bee gets on a landing board and has to go through one of these tubes and it encounters a bee right here, it's getting out of there. They don't want to fight because they either die or the bee that's a resident bee dies stinging them. So we created a defensible area. And it's interesting. So for robbing of the bees, and so do you have to take it out? No, I guess you don't. Because the bees will know that this is their entrance and exit point. What happens if this is a tree and there's a cavity of bees in there? This, this made me think about a lot of stuff. Because the entrance to our beehive is three quarters of an inch thick. Or at seven eighths, for example, if it's one of those Hoover hives that I got, because they're thicker, it seems. But uh, most bee trees are thick. And I was talking to um, Sven, the guy that's doing the, the Asian giant hornets, and they got that hornet's nest out of the tree. He zoomed with our bee club, the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. So if you're in Northeast Ohio, if you're in Northwest Pennsylvania, or if you're in Western New York and you want to join a bee club, Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. There, I plugged it, see. All right, but here's the thing. The thickness of the tree has a small entrance and that entrance goes through the thickness of the outer wall of the tree. So that is a defensive mechanism, a physical defensive mechanism that whatever wants to attack a feral colony of bees in a bee tree has to go through a longer corridor to get in there Therefore, there's more opportunity to encounter guard bees and then they won't make it in. So I think this to some degree imitates that. Anyway, if you get one of these and you try one of these, let me know. I'm actually going to make a page on uh, the waytobee.org on the website. And it's going to say Hive Gate or whatever it's called. And I will post what you tell me your experiences are 
on there if you're going to get one of those. So I'm going to test it throughout 2021. I can't wait to make videos about it. The guy that invented it did a glass bottom beehives, did a couple of glass bottom beehives, and they made observations with cameras and special lighting underneath the hive so they could see the behavior of wasps. What they did was they cut out this bottom portion of this so that when they're looking through the glass, this is an open channel from underneath, and they could see what the behavior is and how wasps behave. So that's on the YouTube channel. Anyway, you can check that out because it convinced me. And it's not a huge investment, so what do I have to lose? So that's what I'm trying out, and that's what I'm going to tell Peter. Get those. If they don't work, not only will I pay for that, I'll give you one of these field guide to honeybees and their maladies if it doesn't work. So just send me an email. The honor system. Fred, they didn't work. Pay, me up, pay up or whatever. Show me what you paid. I'll pay you back. That's how convinced I am that it's going to be a cool thing. Anyway, that's one of the things I'm reviewing this year. Hivegate at uh, BIQ Solutions. So I'll put the link down in the video description. Check it out. Tell me what you think. I think they're cool. I already posted about it on Facebook too. Because I'm that interested. It's because it lines up with what I thought would work. Anyway, next one's from Daniel, Grass Valley, California. I watch almost all of your bee videos and I'm working towards starting into beekeeping this spring with my first hives. I'm collecting supplies needed now and I have two questions for you. Can you explain why people say I should start with two hives instead of one? This costs more, so I need a good justification as I do not have a lot of extra cash. So here's the thing, and this is a two-part question here, but I'm gonna answer this part first. Um, a lot of people say, and this is what I was told to, because back in 2006, 2007, when I was photographing honeybee conditions and documenting things, and the state bee inspector was there, and uh, they had American fowl brood and everything else. But anyway, I think he got tired of me, like chasing around and wanting to show up when they do inspections so we could document that stuff. And I volunteered and gave my photos and stuff away. Anyway, he said, you need to get two hives. And that's because we need to see a comparison. We don't know if our hives are doing great, if they're doing bad, if it's just a bad season, if it's a dearth, what's going on? If you have two hives, you have a comparison. So you can see what's going on. So that's one bonus. The other thing is, going into your first winter, you have one hive of bees. They die, something happens. You're fresh out of bees. So the flip side of that is, you've got a resource to make more bees from if your management skills are good. So that's why kind of the minimum number is two. It's kind of like people that want to get uh, two chickens. I always say get three chickens. If something happens to one of your chickens, you know, and you only had two, now I've got a solitary chicken, they're social. But uh, you don't want to be out of bees. So I suggest two for the same reason that you want, uh, you want to be able to compare things. You want to see what's going on. I've had bees and it seemed like if I only had one colony, I would have thought, you know, bees were failures and they just couldn't do anything. But I had two, so I had a comparison. There's always some opportunity to shine there, plus the insurance. Another colony of bees to keep you in beekeeping if you lose one of your colonies. I'm mentoring a beekeeper this year, and he started with two colonies. One of them's dead for sure. So if he only had one colony, he'd be out of beekeeping if that was the one that died. Second part of this, also for buying bees, I live less than 30 minutes from Randy Oliver, who sells nukes. Would you say those would be pretty good bees to start with this spring? So now Randy Oliver only lives 30 minutes away. What an opportunity. Anyway, Randy Oliver uh, spoke recently about his line of bees because people say, Randy, what kind of bees do you keep? You know, are you keeping Italians? Are you keeping all of, you know, what do you have? Saskatrass, what's going on? Well, he has the bees that, that make it. He was very kind of, nondescript about the bees that he keeps. So he does a lot of treatment testing. Those of you who don't know, the website's called Scientific Beekeeping. So you can go there and read articles and read Randy's research and everything else. So the man has piles of experience, years. He's got, he's a biologist, he's an entomologist. So he's got a scientific approach to beekeeping. He does a lot of testing and evaluating. And so of course he has his own bees that he keeps and they breed and everything else, but he doesn't assign a name to those. Those are just the bees that he works with. So would those be good bees to get? I would say, heck yeah, why not? He's only 30 minutes away. That's the other thing. 
When you order your bees through the mail, when you get packaged bees through the mail, what is the most critical thing in that package of bees? That's going to be the queen. There is, I think, an article that just came out in um, one of the publications. Anyway, it could be the Bee Journal. But uh, the article is about what happens to queen bees and how sensitive the parameters really are when they're in shipment. So even when I buy in a weaver queen from Texas or something, they don't need to get a lot of exposure to elevated temperatures to have their fertility impacted. Likewise, if it's really cold, their fertility can be impacted. Because when they're shipped, there's just a tiny collection of little worker bees with them. So you've got the queen, she's got maybe three or four workers in a cage with her. They're not going to be able to generate a lot of heat to keep that queen warm in transit. Likewise, they may not be able to cool her off adequately in transit. So when you find a beekeeper, a supplier, if I were 30 minutes from Randy Oliver, I wouldn't think twice about buying a package of bees from him. Because I'm going to go there, I'm going to pick up those bees. I'm going to drive that 30 minutes. Now I have total control. Those bees have come out of a controlled environment that the bees are controlling. The queen's in good shape, and I'm going to drive her home, and I'm going to hive her up with no potential risk to what she might have endured in transit. I'm here in the state of Pennsylvania. Those bees get sent all the way from Texas, just the queens. And sometimes they do awesome. Maybe one of the reasons they don't do so awesome is because of some of what they've been exposed to because they don't go completely sterile. They just have a damaged spermatheca, let's say, through exposure to heat, which means they have reduced fertility. So they just it's not that they won't perform at all. They're just not a top performer. So always, if you can get a local source for your bees where you can go hand to box or you can buy your nucleus of bees right there, put them in your car, control the climate all the way home and put them right into a hive the same day, you're so far ahead. So I think that's a fantastic idea. Get your bees from Randy Oliver because he's 30 minutes away and let us know how it goes. That would be interesting feedback, but... I can't imagine what a great advantage it would be to live just 30 minutes from somebody like that with all these bee yards and all these resources. They're probably headed for the almond groves here about mid-February and into March because he does almond pollination, or his sons do, I think. So they'll be loading up their trucks and headed for California. Anyway, the next question is from Deb W., Grassy Creek, North Carolina. I have a horizontal hive that I built incorrectly last year, but the bees took to it anyway. I now want to fix that hive, so I need to rehive the girls. Do you have a procedure for that? I know I will need to wait until at least April since I'm in zone 6A, which is a nice warm zone to be in, but don't know how to stack frames in a standard Langstroth hive. The hive is filled about 12 to 14 frames in its first year, and about eight to nine are brood frames so far. This is my first colony, so I don't want to run them off by rehiving in the wrong way. Do you have suggestions, or do you have a previous video that I can reference? Okay, so things to think about when you're gonna rehive a colony of bees in spring. Well, the one thing is you're rehiving, so we're not changing locations. So all we need is a temporary parking spot. Sometimes, and this is where I'm going to make a suggestion that might involve a product that you don't have. And that's going to be the hive butlers because I bought a bunch of those last year and I can't wait to use them this year to do my splits with, but the procedure is going to be the same. Because we want to replace a hive that she's not happy with the configuration. So we're going to put a hive directly in that same spot. So now without any kind of tote or ability to intermediately stage your frames, you would just set up your brand new bottom board, your brand new deep that they're going to go in. And you also need to accommodate those extra frames. But the good news is there's only eight or nine frames of brood because the brood's critical. So those are what we're going to keep together in the same order they're in in the existing hive. So it's important to do that. The other thing is try to orient orientate those frames the same as they are in the existing hive. So you'll set up your beehive right in front of that hive and you'll transfer those frames to do do to do to do to do. And when you put that box in the spot where the old hive is, try to make sure that your entrance is also oriented the same way as the hive that you're removing. 
Now the reason I want to bring up the Hive Butlers, I don't get anything for telling you about them. But this is what I'm going to do, is I would take the Hive Butler totes, and I'm going to explain why I like them. So anyway, you take all the frames out, keep them in the same order, and they hold 10 frames. So you put all 10 frames the way they exist in a row, and that bottom box is going to be where all the brood is too. So you transfer those in order and keep all the brood in one tote. Set that aside, they also have screen tops for them, but you could just put it on loose if you don't have the screen top style. And then you take a second tote and then you transfer all the second collection of frames that you have there. So you have the potential you can hold 20 frames and you center the frames that have all the resources in that tote and then your new frames that you're gonna add if you're adding those outboard from that. And then you set that aside. Now all the bees are out, but guess what happens when they, and because this is what happened last year when I was looking at the frames and storing them temporarily in the totes, they stay on the frames. They don't cluster all over the box and all over the outside of the box and get clustered on the sides. Because then when you go to put all your boxes together, you got to get your bees out of the way so you're not smashing them when you're putting everything back together. That was eliminated with the Hive Butler totes. So then once they're in the totes and you set them aside, now you get the old hive out of the way and now here's your chance to level everything up take your time get everything situated tilt slightly towards the landing board get your new bottom board in there get your slatted rack on whatever you're going to do if you're going to use that then put your deep brood box on then you take that first tote and just as i said before line them all up and center your brood in the center of that box and then outboard frames from there that may not be full of brood then put the next box on, open the next hive tote, and when you pull those frames out, the bees stay on them. There's no shaking it out of the box. There's no dumping and harassing the bees, and you fill them up. And now you've got two boxes. You put that inner cover on there. You put your insulated top on that, and you're good to go. And they're the exact same spot as before. So, same order as they are in the hive that you're taking them out of. Same direction. Same exposure, northeast, southwest, same entrance orientation as you had before. And because that's what they are, they are already going to be accustomed to, it doesn't mean you can't change it. You could, but this is the easiest transition for them. And hopefully you've already got that entrance facing east or southeast. Or south even for winter time. And you put them all together and you're done. And those high butler totes are good for a lot of different stuff. But when I do splits this year, I'm not going straight from the hive I'm splitting from into the hive box. I'm gonna have the new hive set up, leveled, ready to go. And my intermediate transfer vehicle is going to be the hive butler totes. I can't wait because I already know in advance it's gonna work perfect. So that's my suggestion. I hope that's helpful and I hope you let us know how it works. So you can do either way. I described both methods, but the, the critical thing is the order and organization that does not get a, disrupted when it comes to your brood frames. Next question is from bow hunters. If a person caught a late season swarm, could they take one or two of these store-bought better bee frames with the cones and use a unused new clean paintbrush and paint honey into the comb of the frames and chill them, and then use melted beeswax and paint the wax with the brush to cap the combs, and then put the frames into the bee box to give them some frames of honey for the winter. Have you tried it or heard of anything, anyone trying it? Well, bow hunters, you get the award for the most creative question I've ever received about something like that. I have a lot of questions that probably will go unanswered, but where is this honey coming from that you want to load into the comb? The other thing is melting beeswax and creating your own wax caps with it by painting it on and of course chilling it first and so on. I would, and I hate to step on this great idea because it's pretty darn creative, um, but I personally would not do that. I don't know where that honey came from, number one. What I would do is get them into the hive. We're talking about the better bee frames. That's the better comb, the synthetic pre-drawn uh, frames, which gives them a boost, but I would not try to load that with honey. And I would not, now nothing's stopping you. I'm worried about the source of that honey. Never 
by the way, buy honey from the store, like Subi honey and stuff like that, commercial honey, and try to feed that to your bees. Please don't do that. If it's honey that you've collected from your own hives, then um, you could feed it back to them, but I wouldn't try to load it into the cells for them. The bees will do that themselves. They'll do it expertly, and they're going to organize it on the frames exactly where they want it to be. And then the other part of this is painting beeswax on. I think that's a recipe for disaster because the bees cap those honey cells in a perfect way at the perfect time with their own produced beeswax. Cap wax is the best wax that they're going to make. It's the newest. It's the cleanest. It's the best stuff they're going to put on those cells in the hive. So I would let the bees do that on their own and I would provide them the resources. If that's my honey and I know where it came from, you could feed that to them and that would allow them to rapidly build up and prepare themselves for winter. Or you could go a totally clean route and give them two to one sugar syrup at the end of the year like that. Late season swarm, they need to build up. That's what I've done uh, last fall. So not this past fall, the year before. I had five late season swarms that I hived on purpose because of the better comb and I wanted to test it. I did not provide them with any resources other than the comb, the cells that were already drawn out as we're going into cold weather. Every one of those colonies should have been doomed. And we put uh, two to one sugar syrup on each of those colonies so we'd have that carbohydrate resource there, which they can use to work wax. And uh, I expected you know, all but maybe one or two, I would call it a success if two of them had made it through winter, but all five made it through winter. So I suggest instead of trying to feed them the honey, I would give them two to one sugar syrup on top of the hive late season swarm so that they can start to organize themselves. They're also going to metabolize that to some degree and they're also going to put it where they need it, where they want it. They're going to, that's a much better approach in my opinion than try to go to all that work of trying to cap with wax and everything with a paintbrush and heat and all of that. I wouldn't do that. You'll be just fine. And I think they'll do just fine if you give them a nice clean resource like processed sugar and sugar syrup, two to one by weight. Next question is from Jeff Agard, Whiteland, Indiana. I began my journey to backyard beekeeping in the spring of 2020. I'm currently managing two colonies in double deep 10 frame Langstroth boxes. I want to develop a plan to replace old frames of comb, specifically the four frames that come with each of my nukes, which are nucleus colonies, I assume that I can do this in spring before they move back down to the lower boxes. Are there any other considerations I should be aware of? Can you share your thoughts on the subject? Yeah, I can share my thoughts. It's good to have a plan, by the way. I like that part of it. So Jeff is already laying out a schedule for maintenance of the beehives. And uh, how long do you get out of your comb? Generally, two or three years. So as you get into beekeeping, you start seeing things darkening up. What you'll find is the queen starts using those old brood combs less and less. And they start get, getting used for other things. Honey storage, uh, pollen storage, and things like that. Because with every cycle that brood passes through a cell, not only is the comb getting darker, the comb is concentrating toxins, by the way. Almost no matter where you live, across the board, you're going to be exposed somehow to agricultural pesticide use and uh, or even beekeeper pesticide use and it's going to concentrate itself in the wax so we need to get rid of it so you set up a you know 20 percent removal every season so then your oldest dirtiest frames you're pulling out and you're replacing with either foundationless or some other you know whatever your chosen frame design is if it's acorn heavy wax frames you're putting those in but yeah, we need to cycle out the old stuff and I would say 20% is good. So that's two out of 10. Once you've, you're in your third year. So every year after that, you'll be removing 10% from every hive, your oldest frames and recycling that wax into candles or whatever you're gonna do by rendering it and stuff. But uh, that's it because the queen will stop using them and it'll look like she just won't go down to the bottom boxes anymore in the spring. And that's because she really has old ones and with each cycle of hatch, they leave a thin layer of cocoon residue when it's been used for pupa. And so the cells are actually getting smaller through the seasons. 
with every hatch cycle until ultimately they're too small for the queen to produce her brood in. So get rid of them. Multi reasons for getting rid of the old comb. This name is Best. Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I might have said that wrong. Caledon, maybe. It's Ontario, Canada. Question, in your latest video, number 95, you said that queen bees fly up to nine miles to a DCA. A DCA is a drone congregation area where the queen goes to mate. I've never heard of that queen. I've never heard that queens will go that far. I know that you research all the facts before you comment on scientific data. Could you please tell me which study you generated that info from or garnered that info from? Sorry, can't read today. I've been combining studies and can't, I've been, I've been combing studies and can't find anything that comes close to the nine miles. I refer your info to mentor others and so I would like an answer. Anyway, yes, I will give you an answer. <clears throat> And I was surprised too, nine miles, super long distance for a bee to go. But these studies have actually been done um, in Europe and other parts of the world too, to see how far the bees would go. And it is amazing how hard it can be to find information sometimes. But anyway, information that's immediate to most people right now, this is one example of documented research that was done on how far queen bees will fly, because we know drones can't fly that far. Worker bees don't fly that far. Drones, super expensive, that's heavy cargo. Those things fly out there, they use up their resources fast. They're lucky if they get 10 or 15 minutes at a drone congregation area, they're back at the hive, they're getting refed and refueled every 30 minutes on average. Interesting stuff. But anyway, um, Dr. Thomas Seeley's book, The Lives of Bees, published in 2019, the drone and queen flights are explained and documented chapter seven page 182. There's a discussion where virgin queens found mates 16 kilometers or 10 miles from their parent colonies. So that's even farther than the nine miles. So it's amazing stuff, but also in that book, there's of course the footnotes and they cite the studies and the original researchers that set out these drone areas and tested their queens to see how far they could fly. These are exceptions, by the way. Um, Queens are going to fly to a drone congregation area that they show a preference for. Just because they have the ability to fly to nine, or in this case, 10 miles now, uh, that doesn't mean they're going to. So drone congregation areas tend to also be retained as congregation areas year after year after year. So it's amazing too that the bees pick these spots and uh, that the queens find them. Because a queen, look at this, look at the miracle of that. She's never been out of that hive. She's just hatched. She's a queen. She doesn't fly the day she hatches, so she gets healthy for about nine days and then she takes off on that mating flight. What on earth inspires the queen to go miles away? And she has to be smart because she has to be able to memorize the landscape. She has to memorize landmarks as she travels and then has to come home at a different time of day after she's done her mating flight and after she's gotten together with all the, the happy people at the drone congregation area and after she's killed all of those drones uh, because uh, she needed their genetic material to bring back to the hive. But it is amazing what a queen can do. Just sit, think about where you are and just pick anything that's nine miles away from your location and then imagine an insect it's gonna come out of a hive and fly to some spot nine miles away and then come all the way back and make it home without being eaten by a bird or a dragonfly or something else. It is a miracle. Anyway, that's my answer for that. And we'll move right along here. Next, Heath Miller. Let's see, I'm in the Northeast near your grandfather's home in Chester. That's Chester, Vermont, where my grandmother used to keep bees. Pretty funny. I want to experiment with Long Lang. If you had it to do again, would you stick with the same hive design? What would you do differently? Well, I started to draw this little sketch here really quick to say what I would do different because I get a lot of questions about that. I decided to do a page today. So these are some of the changes that I would make for sure. So with the next one I build, 
One thing is going to be where the cover meets the base, I'm going to have an angled joint there. I'm going to make that out of a single piece. Of course, it goes all the way around. This hive is five feet long. Single two by six. I'm going to cut that angle. I'm going to rip the entire thing so that they match up. And then that's going to follow the whole side. That will save me having to do flashing and stuff. Another thing that I'm going to do is flash the entire roof. Right now the flashing covers the top and the end joint here, but it does not run the full width. It's not that they're showing deterioration, but I just think I would rather have flashing on the whole thing. So I'm gonna flash the entire roof. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna do a rabbit cut to accommodate what holds the ends or the ears of the Langstroth deep frames. I'm going to put a little cleat on there and it's going to be screwed and glued to the wall here. And uh, the only rabbit joint that's going to be in there will be for these one inch thick cover boards that I have, which are currently red oak. So those are changes that I'm making. The other thing is, this is all two by four stock, which is inch and a half thick. These are two two by twelves for the bottom. So I'm not changing any of that. I want this space between the end of the frame to the interior side wall to be 3 8 of an inch now. And I want that bottom opening from the bottom of the frame to the interior surface of the bottom there. I want that to be an inch and a half. I'm not going to change the vents that are in the bottom. And I'm not going to change the entrance, although by raising this and giving it more height here, because this was just a 2 by 12 initially, but I'm adding that cut 2 by 6 here, so I'll be able to raise things a little higher to accommodate that additional space underneath. And that will also potentially give access through this entrance so that people can do oxalic acid and things like that. So what else am I going to change? I think that's pretty much it because it's actually working really well the way it is. And this is all like the roof material. That's 2x4 stock. That ridge piece is a 2x4 that runs the full length. These are 2x12s, two of them. And uh, I think that's the only thing I'm going to change. Now I may use a piece of rolled cotton duck cloth to lay over the top of these 1 inch thick boards. But underneath those is a 3 8 inch space interior service to the top of the back bar of those long Langstroth frames. That's all I'm changing. Can't wait for spring to get in there and see how those bees did through winter. They seem to be doing really well because I'll tell you what, the slightest warm up, they're flying out. They're doing good. They're nice and quiet. Next question, Haven Park Apiary. Let's see, Fred, what are your thoughts on marking and trimming your queen's left or right wing? It's clear to me that advantage for marking. It was explained to me that trimming the queen's wing does two things, discourages flight for swarming, and if she does take flight, the trimmed wing greatly shortens the distance the swarm will go, improving the chance for swarm recovery. Those things are all true. So what color are we talking about? Now there's a phrase I want you to remember, okay? For those of you who want to mark your queens, will you raise good bees? The first letter of each of those words is in order. So will you, the W is for white. So we are going into 2021. The dot for 2021 on queens is white. The next one is you. That'll be yellow. Raise, that'll be red and green and then blue. Good bees. Got it? So it goes like that. So that's an interesting thing. A guy named Charlie Shrek told us that phrase and uh, I took a B class with him many years ago but that phrase stuck in my mind I thought what a great way to remember that so the other thing is we're talking about clipping the queen's wing this drawing of a queen bee is not to scale so you're going to put your marking your dot on the queen's thorax and usually that's shiny and it's large and then there's the segment going into the abdomen so once you get that dot in there, let it dry completely. Don't just dab. And people ask what kind of paint do they use? You know what? Years ago, I bought a fancy queen marking kit. And guess what came with it? A tester's model marking pen. So tester's paint. As long as it's dry, but the bees do, her retinue of helpers do try to chew that off, by the way. So the next thing is never clip both wings. When you look at a queen, this is a terrible drawing, by the way. Her wings only go about half the length of her abdomen when she's in leg, when she's in production and she's full size. 
So we want to unbalance her by clipping just one of those wings off, one set of wings. And you don't try to clip really close to the muscles here. You can just clip, you know, an eighth of an inch or three sixteenths of an inch from that muscle connection there. And you just clip it off one side because now she's unbalanced. Now when she goes to fly, she'll constantly just loop around and loop around. Clipping her wing, and by the way, I had somebody who wrote a message when I talked about wing clipping about how disappointed they were that I was suggesting modifying a queen and uh, they could not watch and could not subscribe and for my channel and things like that. So I share uh, all of this information. So if you're, if you're bothered, I get it, that's okay. But uh, if you clip one wing, and we even do this to chickens, if you want chickens not to be able to fly out of a you know, three foot fence or a four foot fence, for example, all you do is clip their primary flights on one side and the chickens are unbalanced and they just jump and land right back and they can't get out. So it doesn't hurt them. It doesn't hurt the queen too, but we have taken away her liberty to fly the nine miles, for example. Um, so this means that she's going to stay in your yard. Why would you do that? Well, a lot of people, for example, are living in urban areas. A lot of people are living where people are not so friendly to bees and the idea of having a swarm in their garden doesn't appeal to them. In fact, they can have a very caustic response to someone who keeps bees who ends up, uh, generating swarms from their backyard that now land in on a child's swing set, for example, which can happen. So by clipping that wing, this is exactly right. It doesn't stop her from, it's instinctive that they want to swarm and they want to generate a new colony of bees. So when the old queen leaves with all those bees, now you find a cluster of bees on the ground five feet from the hive. And when they realize ultimately that they, they'll stay with that queen for a while. So if you're one of those people, I hope you are, that you can visit the site frequently and see what's going on in your yard, you'll be able to recover her and now you have two options. You hive that old queen with that cluster with a, uh, with a bivouac of bees that went with her and uh, you put them into another hive and now you've got a new colony of bees. Now, if, you're, if you have some kind of owners, you know, fellowship or something that has told you that uh, you can't keep more than one or two colonies of bees, now you call somebody at your bee club and you say, I've got a swarm of bees, you want them, blah, 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 hive them, send them on their way. Uh, you can also remove the queen and uh, the workers then, once they realize that her pheromone is absent, she's not with them, they're going to return to the colony that they left from. And you've affected a brood break because the queen is gone, there's a new queen about to hatch, so you've got a good amount of time there where there'll be no eggs being laid, so you've got a reduction in the population of that colony of bees and uh, a brood break, which helps you with natural varroa control too while you're at it. So those are the options, but yeah, trimming her wing does work and keep her local. And if you don't want to trim the wing, don't trim the wing. If you're in an area where they can fly, or you're totally confident you're going to catch them, they're not going to swarm. This was from Gary Landers, Sisters, Oregon. Let's see, if I have three hives, call them A, B, and C. I want to requeen annually, both for swarm prevention and for a brood break for reducing mite load. Rather than culling my existing queens and paying for three new queens every year, could I just move hive A queen to hive B, hive B queen to hive C, hive C queen to hive A, or would that create confusion for the workers in shifting their queen's pheromones to a nearby hive, which each hive is separated by 75 feet. By the way, there's a really good separation to have your bees 75 feet away. You're not gonna have drift and all those issues. But here's what I would do. This is my suggestion. Now here's where we get into, this is just my opinion. This is, there's no solid, absolute way to do this, but I would not uh, play musical queens and move them into the other hives because uh, you have to get them out of the hives anyway for them to accept a new queen. So we have to get rid of the old queen's pheromone long enough. General rule of thumb is three to four days on that. You get the queen out of there, her pheromone dissipates, and now they're ready for another queen. So then you could, in theory, introduce an alien queen into that colony where she did not belong. But I would like to suggest something else. How about we bank those queens? How about we make a nucleus colony? We pull some frames of brood because you want to have the brood break anyway. 
And you can put all of these queens in their cages into one single hive that is queenless and that has brood hatching out. So we've got young bees, we've got a generation of nurse bees coming out and they're gonna feed those queens because they need a queen. And they'll be a little frustrated, sure, that that queen can't lay. But with the pheromones coming from new bees, from when you pulled brood frame out of there, those pheromones will be good. And they will keep them wanting to feed the queen because the queens now have got those pheromones. But what I would suggest doing, don't rotate them. How long could you bank them for? Bank them for about two weeks. Because... I think that's a good time frame. You'll have a nice long brood break. You won't run the risk of getting into the third week and having them take a chance on um, having layer workers that starts about the third week. So I think two weeks is kind of the sweet spot. The other thing is they won't generate a new queen. How long does it take to generate a new queen? Let's say when you took the queens out, there were some eggs in there and you left them behind instead of moving them into your banked queen box. Um, if you left them there, how quickly could they make a new queen? 15 days. So if we get in there within two weeks, we're going to replace the queens without the new queens hatching out and spreading their pheromones around. And you have a chance to, of course, remove those queen cells just in the nick of time before they hatch out. So I think two weeks is kind of like the maximum sweet spot. And you can also refresh those colonies if you want to, because you probably had open brood when you pulled those queens out. And when you banked them, so that as those get capped, you can put those capped brood frames in that colony too, which again, helps reduce the numbers there and continue that brood break. And you put them back, I suggest, in the colonies that they came out of, because those are their genetics, they will be most easily accepted. Worst kind of potential is that you take a queen and insert her into another hive and they reject her. So now you've lost a queen. So I suggest recycling them back to that original colony. But the next thing is, if the only goal here is just to keep them from swarming and to have a brood break though, uh, you can keep them from swarming, but you wouldn't get the brood break unless you remove the queen. So one of the options is to leave her in there, in that colony, and you can get a brood break by putting a cage around the queen. And some uh, beehive supply companies sell these little wire frame cages that go over her that leave her a number of cells in there so she can continue to be fed. She can also continue laying eggs. Those eggs can hatch. It's like a queen excluder. Um, the workers could come out and get through this queen excluder. Or if it's too small for that, the workers hatch out and they stay right there with her. But I would recommend that it were more like a queen excluder so the workers could come and go and attend to those areas, feed the you know, the larvae when she lays eggs in there. So now we have a controlled area. So in other words, you have this big reduction in brood. So you have kind of a brood break. There are other complicated methods for that, but if that's what you're trying to do, you could bank them, you could cage her. And uh, those are my two, two methods. And if you're trying to avert having them swarm, then you want to just monitor the bees and make sure that as the population builds, that they have more space, more frames, more boxes to move into. And then as you come to the end of the year and their numbers decline, then you're condensing down the boxes. You're doing the opposite. So I hope that gives some food for thought. This is from Rebecca Beck. Uh, I have a long wire snake camera. A long wire snake camera, about a quarter inch in diameter that connects to my iPhone, which I originally purchased to view and inspect a cistern. If you look directly into the end, it has a small LED light. I had an idea to look at my bottom board under a slatted rack and turn to peek up at the cluster, but not, but not advance off the bottom board. Do you think this small light would be too intrusive and disturb the cluster? Seems like a cool idea, but I don't want to consider it if I will interfere with their winter survival. I was trying, I was going to do something cool today, but it's only in the twenties outside. But so what we're talking about is an endoscope. See this right here? This thing is waterproof. This one is just under a quarter inch. And I'm going to turn this thing on. 
but I'm going to show you what we're talking about because these things have LEDs on them. And uh, this is what it looks like. So if I turn this light on, see that light? And this light has a brightness control, so that's off, bright, dim, and dimmer. The other thing is, this particular one also has a lens and a light on the side of it. So then that comes on, I hope you can see that. And then again, we control the dim, brightest, dim, dimmer, and then off. These things are extremely handy. This particular one is the NTS 500 by Teslong. And you can stick this thing in here. And what I do is put a bend in it already because it's not articulated. It's not that cool. And so you put this through the entrance board. Let me get this in front of my shirt. And then as you get it in there, you curve it like this. And if you're looking for one of these, you get one that's got a lens on the end that looks straight up. And of course, you turn your light on and look at 90 degrees. Some of them have mirrors. And you can take videos or stills. You can do video in 1080p. But uh, what I would like to do is just demonstrate that you can look at your bees really close. And this is coming up so when spring comes or when I get a warm weather day, they don't want you to use this. It's because it's waterproof, I can rinse this off in the sink after it's been in the beehive. And we get very close, very close um, focus on this. So I can't show you very well. Ooh, that's gross. This is my hot chocolate. So you look around or you look at your bees. See, there's the bees there. And this thing is, that's within an inch. So we can look at that. So you can record this stuff. And so I recommend that you get one that has the mirror so you can do the 90 degree check. And to answer the question, other than to demo that real quick for you, the bees don't care. Sometimes guard bees follow it around and that's a pain because they see that little light and that's why having the dimmer on there is so that when you get really close to something, the light is dim and you can see it with clarity. But the guard bees start to follow it around wherever it goes. They run in a little cluster and chase that little light around. So once they've noticed it, they're just in the way. It doesn't really upset them that much. And you have the ability to turn your light off. So what you can do is once you get it in position, turn the light off. Wait a few seconds so they lose interest. Then turn it on again and get to see what you're looking for. Take a picture with your phone or grab that video really quick. So you can see the frames and stuff. And then turn the light off again and off you go. Some people say that, well, if you put a red filter on it, well, first of all, you're going to lose camera lens resolution on those things. So putting a filter on it doesn't work that well. The other thing is I've shined red light spectrum lighting into my observation hive and they go right after the red light too. So they do respond to it, but I don't think it's that upsetting. I think it's more fun to get the information. And uh, for those of you who drill those quarter 20 holes, the quarter 20 threaded screw holes for the back so that you can do oxalic acid vaporization, for example. You can actually run your screw, quarter 20 screw, through there first to make sure it's nice and clean so you get the propolis out of the way of that hole. And then you can actually feed this right through that from the back so you can see what's going on in there. It's too bad it doesn't take temperatures and things like that. And that would be helpful. But I would say do it. Don't even worry about it. The bees are only, only the guard bees care. And it's momentary. Next one is from Aaron Lockett. Uh, hi there, thank you for making this video. It's a video about bees in snow. I discovered some bees in the snow today and decided to try to revive them. With a little warmth, they began to breathe again, so I collected as many as I could, brought them inside to warm them up in a butterfly terrarium. Over half the bees have already woken up and are enjoying some honey. They all seem to be worker bees, not drones. There are others who did not wake up and could be dead bees that either didn't make it or were originally carried out. If I release them on a warmer winter day at the same location, might they fly their way back to their hive? Thanks for any insight. I'm fostering about 30 found in the snow in New Jersey. This comes up a lot because People see the bees in the snow and they just want to help them. So they want to pick them up and 
one of the things we want to know is what colony did they come out of? Um, and people have put them on landing boards and sometimes they get back in, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they get put on a landing board, they get tossed right back out or they get stung or one of the workers in there grabs them by the foot, drags them out, drops them in the snow. So the other thing is how long are we going to be holding on to these bees? Bees, you have 30 of them and they could be fed honey, I guess, and everything, but bees are social. Also, uh, keeping them in a warm interior space might seem like a good idea, but then when they go back out for the cold, they're going to be shocked again. So you get a warm day. I'm not sure how many colonies of bees are here uh, that we're talking about, but it has never in my experience worked well to collect bees that are dead or dying in the snow or even on bottom boards and things like that because I collect them. And then if you put them back, they end up not doing well. Here's, here's some things that you have to think about too. Why are they not currently part of the cluster? I understand when they fly out, they get shocked by the cold and they could land in the snow. And so that's the, and the only reason they stayed out was because they landed in the snow and couldn't recover. So this ties in with some of the things I've talked about this year a little bit, which is an advantage of elevating beehives, not only to keep them out of the range of skunks that can jump up and get their landing boards, but the higher hives have more of a flight opportunity for the bees that are flying out to do cleansing flights. They can take off and they just do a touch and go off the snow, for example, where I notice the lower hives, the bees fly out, pile into the snow more often and then can't make it back even if they wanted to. Now that's the other thing. How many of them are actually trying to get back to the hive? So sometimes they're flying out as cathodic protection. They're just going to protect the hive by taking germs with them if they're sick or something else is going on and they die in the snow. So we have 30 bees total and I don't know how many colonies there are. So generally I tell people don't even try to put them back. Now, if you're just going to take them out on a warm day and see if they just happen to fly back to their original colonies, I guess there's no harm in that. They may or may not know where they live. So if you've only got one colony, then we know where they're going to go. But if you have several colonies, you're kind of probably staying off the inevitable, which is that they're ultimately going to, on that warm day, you take them out there and they can't find which colony they came from anymore. And then they just die because it's much different for a worker to fly out of a colony and do a little corkscrew orientation and then opt to do their thing and then find their way back than it is to keep them away from it for a while, then put them out and see if they have the memory capacity to find their way back to the colony that they came out of. So they could be landing on a foreign colony and then be rejected on that landing board because they're not a resident bee and they certainly aren't bringing a bunch of resources with them, which could give them a pass to get in. So just in general, um, there's a lot of transference. You know, there's a lot of human psychology involved in people thinking that they feel bad, that they're sad and that we can help them. And, and it's really, it's a transference of human emotion onto insects. But uh, it doesn't mean you, you can't try, but those are just some of the hurdles that you'll probably be going over. And uh, you're going to try to get those bees back in the colony that they came out of. I hope they don't just turn right around and leave again after you've put all your time and effort into it. But at the very worst, you have an opportunity to observe those bees and see what's going on. Check them for varroa and stuff while they're out there, if they're healthy. So that was the last question. And uh, I want to thank you for being here. If you have not clicked the like button down there, Please do that and it will help you remember that you've seen this video because there are a lot of them out there. We're going to keep running going every Friday or Saturday. And uh, don't forget to inspect all your colonies for food this time of year. We're going to hit crunch time here, which is where some of the bees may have used up all the resources in the hive and where just a little sugar on top could have saved those bees. Also, as we come up on spring, think about if you have hives that are too small, colonies that need help, what you're going to do and make preparations for swarms. Again, I can't tell you because I can't tell you this enough because when they do start to build up, it seems to happen so fast and all of a sudden the warm weather comes and you know, Aaron's gonna be putting those bees back in those hives and these bees are gonna be building their numbers. And uh, they also build a lot of brood, which is why the demand for resources goes up, which is why they end up frustratingly starving out in February and March as they prepare for the season for the bloom. 
So be ready for all that stuff. If you're looking for a place to get your questions answered day or night, and you want to share pictures, you want to share a video, you've got something going on with your bees, and you want to get information from fellow beekeepers all over the world, join the Way to Bee Fellowship right on Facebook. There's going to be a link down in the video description that you can go and find that. Yes, you have to be let in, uh, but almost nobody gets turned away unless you're one of those hostile people. So it's a friendly place. You can share stuff. And if you just have a thought and you want an answer right now, you don't want to wait for a Friday or you think I may not get to your question, that is a great place to go. We have fantastic moderators, good collection of people. And uh, what else? If you're going to do this, let me know. I want to know how it worked. Citizen science. I want to get feedback from a bunch of different people, good, bad, or otherwise. Let me know if you try out one of those hive gates to... Stop robbing, get the wasps out, and uh, any number of other things that could benefit your colony that way. So what else? Thewaytobe.org. Oh yeah, for those of you who want to know if you can get this stuff as a podcast, it is The Way to Be on Podbean. That link is there also. And that's it. Thank you. I'm glad that you were here today. I hope that the weather is warmer where you are than it is here because we have storm systems just pounding the eastern United States right now. So let me know what's on your mind. Put your comments down in the comment section below. And I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for being here today.